In this episode of This Week in Photo, Joel Robeson joins the show. He's a photographer and also a compositing artist. And that's one of the main reasons I wanted to bring him on the show is to talk about the nexus or the intersection of artificial intelligence and compositing. Do they mix? That's coming your way next. This is Twitter. Hey, folks, welcome back to the show. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson, along with my co-host, Mr. Alistair Jolly. Alistair, how's it going? Good you know who we have waiting. It's going well. With us today. You know who we I have do. Waiting. And, you know, it's always it's always fun doing these shows. But when it's someone you, you hope considers your friend and you feel as a friend of yours, it's always very special to, to have a conversation with them. So, yeah, really excited to talk to Joel today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's definitely been a, a great um, few years, and um, I can't complain. I, I think life has has kind of rebounded since the last time we've spoken. It's been a lot of changes in the world, but um, I'm still working and and living as an artist full time, and I I can't imagine doing anything else. I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's, I, I'm looking forward to this conversation for a, a bunch of reasons. One, obviously. I'm curious about how someone like yourself, an accomplished compositing artist, is perceiving the AI steamroller. You know, is it is it mana from heaven or is it a, a tar pit? You know, <laughs> which one? So I want to get your thoughts on that, and then or somewhere uh, in between, or somewhere in between. You know, because <laughs> that's normally what the world is. But before we before we dive into the conversation in earnest, Joel, just for the folks that may not have heard of you, um, of course, I'm going to have a gallery of your work in the blog post, the show notes for the episode. And I encourage them, to, of course, go check out your your uh, Instagram profile. But give us the give us the Joel Robeson elevator pitch. What, what is it <laughs> that you do and why do you do it you know, as, a, as an as an artist? Yeah, so, you know, I've been doing this for over a decade now, and I'm still so bad at that elevator pitch. <laughs> because yeah, I, I, how I, I how I interpret myself changes depending on the day. But I, I would say that I'm a, a creative storytelling photographer. So I, I've long been inspired by um, great storytellers of the past, especially like Lewis Carroll and C.S. Lewis and Dr. Seuss, those kind of whimsical wildly creative people that just build these imaginative worlds and stories. And um, I like to do that in the photos that I create. So I try to to create images that are kind of a tableau or, or a glimpse at a story and kind of give the viewer the opportunity to to create a, a story based off of that image. And, and they're all deeply connected to who I am as a person as well. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And and the work is fantastic, right? Alistair, I mean, like look looking at the the pieces, they they your work is the epitome of storytelling, right? Cuz a lot of we talk on this <laughs> photo a lot about photographers that I mean, it, it it seems it seems flippant to say that, but you know, a lot of photographers are, you know, we're taking photos cuz we like taking photos or we like the gear or mm. you know, but we're not necessarily telling stories. And I feel like things are moving back in that direction in earnest. Maybe it's powered by we have all these great tools available to us to tell stories better. Or maybe it's a mm. uh, it's I don't know. I don't know what it is, but you were already there. You were already telling yeah. stories <laughs> in a single frame. Right. I don't know. I don't, mm. I and we've we've in. often yeah, we've often spoke on this show about certainly my love of photography that tells a story like the, the images that really speak to me are the ones that either uh, describe and, and show me an incredible story or lead me to imagine my own story and i've off always been drawn to joe's work just because of the you know the exceptional levels of storytelling um that not only drag uh, drag me into Joel's world, but make me think about another world maybe for myself, but also really engage with my family. My kids love Joel's mm -hmm. work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've we've spoke at length about that before. Joel and I, you know, my kids uh, really engage with the, the stories that Joel's telling. But what I always find incredible, Joel, is you're so prolific. 
uh, it would take me all all year to probably come up with and tell just one of the stories that you tell. But you you in my mind seem to be very prolific, and I wonder how you manage to keep up with the, with that pace and that level of of storytelling. Yeah, I mean. I, I've always been a really visual person and interpret what's going on around me um, in visuals. So even when I try to explain what I'm thinking or feeling, I always have to kind of, there's there's like that line from the Golden Girls, like the little Sophia, she's always like, picture it. And she illustrates the story yeah. she's telling. And, and that's kind of the way I've always been is like, okay, picture, this is what it looks like. And I have to explain to people kind of what something looks like because that's how I interpret it for myself. And so I think it's such a natural way for me to think in a in a visual or in a picture. So the stories that I'm telling are are really just interpretations of something that I'm thinking about or feeling or experiencing. And I'm just trying to attach a visual to that for my own reference or for my own connection to other people. And so mm -hmm. it never feels like I'm, I'm in a race to produce or I'm in, you know, a, a machine to produce. It feels like it's a, a conversation between me and, and the viewer, um, just me relating to something through a visual just that natural cadence you have of, of storytelling I, you, it's funny I, I couldn't help think there about you know in the corporate world when we have you know meetings and someone will inevitably say you know this could have been an email rather than us all being together <laughs> in, you, in, in your world you said this, this could have been a photograph <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> yeah I, i'm curious where where the, it, are you are you looking at the stories that you're telling in these works joel as a it's kind of a diary. This is your visual diary. And like you said, it doesn't matter how long it takes. It's just a conversation that you, this is the best way for you to get it out. Or is it more, is it coming more from an artist's fire within like these, these artworks need to find their way to other people to see them, you know, which, which direction I feel like it's more towards the diary. Yeah, I would say that it's definitely more of, of a diary or, or, or record of my own experience. And I think, you know, when I first started in photography, I I hate to age myself, but okay. it was like okay. 2008 or something that I first kind of really got into into this style of photography. Um, it, it really was an opportunity for me to learn about myself. Um, as, as well as learning the skills, you know, about using a camera and, and using Photoshop and, and storytelling. But it was really, you know, I, I had never had the, the opportunity to learn about myself and, and what I think about things and what I feel about things. And so um, I kind of started to see the benefit of using self-portraiture especially, but also just photography in general as as a marker for that specific emotion or thought. And so I saw the benefit of like attaching all of that to an image. And so it really did become a, a journal. And and I I did, I've done now five 365 projects. So it's a photo a, a day for a year. And, and mm -hmm. you know, that is essentially a diary. It is, a, you know, a daily recollection of whatever it is that you're thinking about or feeling about. And, and I think that's the joy of, of having all of that available is like, I can go back to those years in, you know, 2011 or something and, and look at an image and I can be brought right back to, to what I was thinking mm -hmm. about or feeling or, mm -hmm. or thinking, you know, while creating. And, and that's a, that's a personal connection that I have to that story. It's sort of like the back end of that story, but someone that isn't me might see that image and have a totally different story and, and connect on a different level. And I think that's, that's the beauty of, of any time, any kind of storytelling is that it's like a, a, a two way mirror almost like I have a, a story, but the viewer has a story and sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're different, but it's, it's all part of, of that unique experience of art. So I, I really enjoy that part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to, the, the viewers of the work are going to imprint their own sort of emotions and worldview on whatever they're mm -hmm. looking at as like any other mm -hmm. piece of art right they're gonna get get something out of it you know i'm curious like you're the a day in the life like are you still doing the 365 project is that an ongoing thing or did no. you stop that so so when, bring us bring us behind the scenes on one of these works right how how are we how are you going from 
Like from what to what? Is it you have a sketch of an idea or a feeling, a germ of a feeling, and then you sit down in from a in front of a blank screen in Photoshop and then get it going? Like, take us briefly, take us through your your artist flow. <clears throat> um, well, I'm I'm actually not a very organized person in my day to day life, um, but when it comes to creation, I am pretty organized, or or at least I plan things out quite quite well. Um, so I have, um, I have a sketchbook and, a, and kind of an ideas book. Um, and it's sort of like my, I like to call it like my, um, like my book of spells almost, because it's just like a bunch of random things. Like if anyone else ever finds that book, it's just going to look like I am a crazy person that's just writing words down on a sheet of paper. Um, but for me, I, I, I like to kind of start with a word or a phrase or an emotion or whatever it is in the center of the page and just sort of explode out everything that connects to that word and then let that sort of build a visual um, in my head and then I, I I really think about you know what what location is going to work well to tell this story and and what do I need to bring with me and what time of day what time of year uh, what weather all those kind of components that go into the the technical side or like the creation side of it um, so I, I I like to get as organized and prepared as I can it without fail every photo opportunity is always wrought with some sort of chaos or, or <laughs> misstep but that's part of the adventure um, but I, I like to bring all my stuff with me and, and, and sort of go out into nature. And, and for me, I would say the majority of my work is shot uh, on location outside. And that's a huge part of the experience for me to, to remove myself from sort of the, the everyday life of being in a, in a building or being in a town or a city and just go out into nature by myself. And, and that gives me an opportunity to, spend time with my own thoughts and to, to reflect on what I'm creating. And I really just get in the zone when I'm, when I'm outside, it's just like time falls away and I, I look for the location or I go to the location and I shoot everything and I, I work in that space. It's sort of my, my outdoor studio. And once I've collected all the components or all the pieces of the puzzle, then, then I get to bring it home and, and sit down and, and put it all together into Photoshop. And, um, I, it's hard for me to say which, which part I like the most. I, I like planning the, the stories and the images. I love going outside and, and creating them. And I, I enjoy sitting at home and putting them all together. So the whole experience really is, 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 enjoyable but it, it is quite planned out and it is very intentional i i sometimes will just go out with no plan in mind and just see what falls out of my head <laughs> um, uh, yeah. but for the most part i do like to have an idea of what i'm doing and and i think that's that for me is is a sign that i'm i'm really intentional on what i'm creating and i'm thinking a lot about the process of it all and i think that's the great thing about listening and learning from other storytellers who do the same thing is that you see how thoughtful their work is and how much it means to them and i think um i like that part of my own work that it is thought about and it is planned and it is um there's layers to it and there's there's an experience involved in it yeah yeah. And one of the big things I love about your work, Joel, is that although there it's it's a composite image, almost all the elements that are in your photographs are, are photographed on location mm -hmm. or photographed. Mm -hmm. They're not they're not stock stuff that's put into the, the the composition. If you have a teacup or a notebook or a ladder or a light or something that's an element of your photograph, you photograph that <laughs> in the location and then add it together, right? Yeah, and that, I mean, that can be where the chaos <laughs> exists, because I've been known to bring some, some odd things to odd places. And um, that's part of the story. That's part of the, the kind of funny behind the scenes that I can think about and share if I want to, or pretend like it never happened. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I've, I've, I remember years ago, carrying about nine pumpkins into the middle of the woods in like shopping bags and a backpack and just like setting them all up and, and just like someone walking past me, like totally not understanding what I was doing out there, but I had a vision and I had a plan, but like I've, I've, yeah, I've stuffed my backpack with all sorts of stuff and carted it off into the middle of nowhere. And, um, it's part of the experience It's part of the, 
it's it's it feels like I'm fully invested and I'm fully involved when I get to do that. And and you know there there are people that will say you know why don't you just use a stock photo or like why don't you just you know shoot it on a green screen and it's not as fun. It's not as it's not as engaging. It's not as you know it doesn't feel as real for me. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Is your, we, do you think of yourself as a as a professional photographer or an amateur photographer? Um, I would say I'm a professional artist, <laughs> but I don't know if I, yeah. I'm a professional photographer. I'm, I'm, I use a camera in every, in every image. So it, it always starts with me using a camera. And, and I would say that, you know, my, my meat and potatoes, the vegan meat and potatoes, I guess, if we're, if we're <laughs> going that direction, um, <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> is, is, is that creative c composite work, but I've also worked as a, a photographer, I've, I've worked on client shoots or I've worked on, you know, more traditional photography commissions or, or projects that are photo heavy or that rely on the photo skills. And I'm, I, I know that I'm, I'm competent in a, and have the ability to do that. It's not necessarily my passion to do those things, but um, I would say I'm a professional artist that uses a camera um, as a tool. So I, I think you know, like I said, I, my definition to what I am depends on the time of day, <laughs> I think, or the project I'm working on. But, you know, I think it, it's it's always been interesting when, when I introduce myself to someone who doesn't know what I do and, and I say I'm a photographer, you know, they'll think that I'm a wedding photographer or that I'm a, a documentary mm. photographer or that I'm a, a journalist. And, mm. and then I, I kind of have to say, like, no, it's a little bit more like, abstract than that <laughs> and so yeah. you know i think for most people when they think about a photographer they think a very traditional sense and so mine is is a little bit more layered and has a little bit more um kind of flexibility in in the term yeah i'd love to talk about um you know you you did there, were, there was a moment where you went from being let's call it an amateur photographer to suddenly realizing you could do this uh, full time mm. as a as a living, and you know, obviously we got to know each other through Flickr. Uh, mm -hmm. You know where you did all your three six fives and stuff. But uh, there was one big commission you got that kind of kicked off your career. I'd love for you to tell people about that one if they don't know. Yeah, yeah and I mean, I have to give a huge amount of credit and and gratitude to Flickr because that was truly the avenue that that showed me that path was possible and and facilitated that that change in my life um so i was hired uh, by fifa and coca-cola to go on the 2014 fifa world cup trophy tour so uh, to kind of back up that story a few years prior to that i had uh, shared some uh, photos of coke bottles and um on Flickr and um someone that works at Coke that was also a photographer using Flickr found those photos or came across those photos and wanted to kind of incorporate them into their social media and kind of that trickled into like me working with them moderating their Flickr account which kind of then trickled into some other little projects and then all of a sudden I was you know on the phone being offered this job to to travel around the world for 9 months um with the FIFA World Cup trophy and and to photograph the entire event and it was sort of like it, it was like a fork in the road that was like you know this amazing path forward and then like also you have no idea what is is <laughs> down that path or it's like I can keep doing what I'm doing and I can already see that I'm going to burn out working two jobs and and you know the passion is there but it's unknown as well and so I just kind of had to say yes um, how can you say no to that and and that was you know that was 11 years ago and i've been working full-time ever since and, and you know a huge a huge part of that was was Flickr being there supporting artists supporting photographers helping to facilitate that sort of you know connection between photographers and and clients and you know during that trip i i was actually flown to um to new york to do a, a my Flickr moment uh, video and mm. uh, um that even that day when that video came out was like another total like career pinnacle because it just like 
the avalanche of <laughs> support and views and 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 I still get messages from people saying like I saw your video in like a McDonald's or something and <laughs> I'm like what <laughs> like how but but you know it, it just yeah, was cool. it was just a wild experience and and you know I I love that about Flickr is that you know the support for the people that use the platform has always been there and and you know to have those stories of people that that got started on Flickr. And I was just talking with a friend about that a few weeks ago. Like she asked me, do you think Flickr knows like how many careers were started because of Flickr? And I was like, I think they do because they, you know, they celebrate and uplift those people, but they probably, you know, there's probably so many out there. That probably more than started. we realize. Yeah. yeah. But not a bad, uh, not a bad first gig. Yeah? <laughs> well, it's, let's fly you around the world. No. For like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, there's there's a ton, uh, not a ton. There's a couple of photographers that I know. Joel, you're one of them, and um, I don't know if you knew uh, or Alistair, if you know a photographer, Rebecca Goodlifstadter. Do you remember her? She's a Icelandic photographer who does self portraiture and compositing work. Completely different from what Joel is mm. doing. Hers is more. It's more. Uh, I don't know, fam. I don't know. It's you have to look at it. I'll link to it in the show notes. It's hard to put a finger on it because it's all, all of her photos are different, but they're all set in this Icelandic, beautiful blue iceberg kind of situation. Not a bad place to do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah not a bad place. <laughs> Joe, before we move on to the the sort of the AI thoughts, um, I'm curious about you know you talked a little bit about process, but gear itself. You know, I'm gonna make this a gear mm. conversation. But are you are you a gear purist? Like you have a camera, I got a fire. 5D I've been using for years and I you know you can pry it from my cold dead hands or are you on the latest and greatest Canon Sony Nikon Fuji Ooh. kit <laughs> I, th I think um, I can guess <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm definitely someone that you know I like to make the most of what I have and you know I I've never been the type of person in, in any facet of my life to to need to have the newest best you know fastest thing I think if, if you can use any tool and use it well um, you know that's a sign of your skills and your ability you don't necessarily need to have all the gadgets and all the gizmos to, to kind of back it up um, I use a Sony um, an a7r4 um mm -hmm. and you know i've i've used sony for the last decade and, and i really enjoy the the cameras and, and and the equipment but i'm definitely just someone that's happy to use the tools that i have and, and i use the most out of them and and i i don't ever feel that i'm i'm focusing on the tool itself i'm thinking more about how can I use it to to tell the story I'm telling? And, and I mean, there's definitely benefits to having, you know, a, a newer model or, or there's functionality that makes it easier. You know, when I first started taking self portraits, I I had to rely on the good old 10 second timer, um, which meant you know I was doing a lot of sprinting, <laughs> I was doing a lot of running back and forth. Um, probably helped keep me in shape. Uh, but now, you know, there's built in intervalometers, so you can just set it to run for 10 minutes and off you go. And, you know, you don't have to run back and forth. So there's definitely like keys to, to the, you know, the technology, but I, I'm, I'm more about what you do with it rather than what you have. Mm. Yeah. Have you ever used, uh, your like mobile photography, ever used cell phones, like iPhones or anything to, have you ever tried going as simple as that? Um, I think like I've dabbled in it a little bit, but mm. I, I, I like sitting in front of a big screen <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you know, I, I hate to use the word, word like a pixel pusher, but like, I really like just being able to see what I'm doing in, in a big way. And, and for me, it helps, it helps me kind of immerse myself into the work when I get to be looking at it in a, in a big screen. So I've never been enticed. I mean, I, I, I don't even like using my phone, like for anything. So, um, <laughs> I never, I, I'm, I'm never kind of answers a call. Like I'm, I don't, I don't. And I, uh, yeah, I think I, I, I use my phone in a very basic way, but I've never been enticed to use it necessarily creatively. Yeah, oh, interesting. Yeah. So yeah, so no photography with the, <laughs> with the like spur of the moment. You're at dinner. I mean, like, oh, I want to put myself in this glass <laughs> of wine. You know? <laughs> no, never been tempted. 
No, no. Well, that's awesome. Neil, before we move on, a quick question, Joel. Of all the work that you've created over the years, are there any, like, is there a single one in there that you're like, this is my favorite one? For Mm. it may not, it may not be the best technically, or it may be the best technically, but this one is my desert island piece of work. I feel like I love it the most. (laughs) Or is it like a favorite child? You can't have one. (laughs) Yeah. I, yeah, it's tough because I think, you know, each one has a, a personal connection in some way and um, it's really tough to find one or to narrow it down into one that like I I like the most. But I, I think there's, there's always one that I go back to when I think about an image that feels like me, that feels like my kind of my style, but it also reflects really deeply into into who i am and there's a photo that i took and it was it was the last photo that i took before i went on that trip with fifa and coke so it was sort of that last image before my life changed and um it was taken in a field that i would you know photograph in quite often and it's just a picture of like my hands coming out of this tall grass with some balloons floating in the sky and like a teapot pouring some tea into a glass in my hand and the process of creating that it was just like i knew that everything in my life was going to be different after that point so it was just like you're kind of like just about to open a door and you're just taking one last look around before you go through that door and and i just remember every single thing about that that experience i remember how quiet it was i could hear you know birds flapping their wings in the sky i could hear the grass moving in the wind and just the whole process of creating it, it just felt like a dance in a way. Like I just was moving around and I was just so aware of everything that was happening. And I think it was because I knew, you know, the next time you're in this space creating, you're going to have done something that you never would have thought you'd have done. And you don't mm-hmm. know where your life is going. And so when I look at that image, I think, you know, that feels like me because it looks like my my style and it looks like, you know, the colors and, and the visuals that I like to use. But the story behind it is like such a, a personal story that that's the one that I think if, if my house was on fire and I had all my photos printed, like that's the one I would probably save. Yeah. Is that the one if someone said, you know what, uh, you know, there's this, there's a $5 million job on the line <laughs> and you gotta, you gotta pick one photo to show the art director what you can do. This has to be representative of you, your skill, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. It would be that. Picture. I think, I think so. I mean, it's, I would say like my skill set has definitely grown in the last 10 years since I, I took that photo, but I think that's the one that feels um, it feels just like, I like to kind of think it, it's like an exhale. So it just like, it feels like it came out of, of me. And I think that's, yeah. that's what I think of when I see that. Fantastic. All right. So here's, here's a topic du jour in that. And I think <laughs> based on the first, the first portion of this conversation, I think I know where it's going to go. <laughs> so artificial intelligence, generative AI, mid journey, Leonardo, Adobe's, you know, all, all the different tools that we have available to us now to create these fantastical works from a prompt or even generate assets to use in a composite from a prompt, et cetera, backgrounds, you know, on and on and on. Where do you fall on that whole world of, you know, robots creating artwork? Yeah. um, It's kind of funny because I, (laughs) I was going to wear a a sweater I have that has a little um, embroidered, wally kind of on the on the chest and i i've wally is my favorite movie and it's been really a strange thing because in the last couple of years like it's sort of starting to come true <laughs> and it's sort of like mm. parts of wally are actually you know it's not too far off from from where we are now and so yeah i it's been it's been an interesting year i would say in terms of this ai um experience and maybe panic or or whatever word you want to use i would say that for me um i'm i have a lot of feelings about it (laughs) Um, i think about it probably every day and it's never really in a positive way um i think it's a very layered conversation and i think it depends on who 
who you're talking about it with. And I think my personal um, my personal feelings are really tied to me as an artist and and an artist in multiple ways. Um, because I know that my work was used to train the models um, mm -hmm. without my permission. And mm -hmm. and to me, that is sort of like where I have to begin with my thoughts on it. Um, I have to think about it very objectively, but it's also very personal when you know that your work was used without your permission um, to train something that is trying to copy what you're doing. So it's, it's a very um, tricky conversation to have. And so um, that, you know, it took, when I first found that out, when I first realized or found out that my work had been used in that way, it, my, my first reaction was quite emotional and quite reactive um, and, and rather negative, <laughs> let's just you say. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it, uh, it, having my work being used without my permission is not new. Um, it's happened pretty much since the day I started um, and, it, you know, in all different ways. Um, but this was definitely like a new feeling and, yeah. and it, it was quite tricky because on the one hand, you know, you kind of see this like violation of your own work, but then you see all these other people celebrating it or, or excited about it. And it's like, you kind of want to like point at your house on fire being like, but wait, like <laughs> this is actually yeah. not, not necessarily mm. all good. And so like, yeah. I hated to be the party pooper, but it definitely felt like I was, you know, waving kind of a bit of like a red flag, like maybe we should slow down a little bit. Um, so I think that's where my feelings about it first were based in is knowing that my work had been used. And then, you know, I'm always a bit cautious of, of anything brand new because, you know, we don't necessarily know the, the, the damage it can do or the limitations it has. And so I, I I'm always quite nervous about trying anything new. And, and I took a back seat kind of just waiting to see what was going to happen. And, and, you know, I can see, I don't want to be naive to think that, you know, there's no positive in it. I can definitely see where there's positives in, in using the, that technology in helpful ways, in supportive ways, you know, I would love for it to be able to like call my photo hard drives for me <laughs> because mm -hmm. they're a disaster. So if, it, if I could just tell it, you know, it, anytime you see a photo that's out of focus, just go ahead and delete that because I don't need it. Um, you know, that that's great. But, but the creation aspect of it is something that it definitely worries me. It definitely makes me feel a little bit nervous. Yeah. You were, you were yeah. quite, um, quite diplomatic in your answer there because I know <laughs> when when you know it first came out that you know these huge bodies of work had been used to train these models and, and of course I represent brands that are those bodies of work um, you know it's smug mug and flicker so you know I was very aware especially from your um, your emotions that you laid out socially on, on online the how how you felt about that and I can't you know, I can't imagine how it feels to have this body of work, you, as you say, used to train a tool that then is monetized. You know, people are mm -hmm. people are making money from this tool. It's not just that it's benefiting people, and we now have these AI tools that can do things. But you know, someone's making money from you know having taught something from your work and um you were you were certainly way more vocal about that than you've just been so <laughs> yeah, you, you yeah. Don't have to <laughs> i i definitely have to kind of rein it in a little bit because i know that once i get going it can be quite again i i i i'm a very calm person you know yeah. in, in general but you know when i see something a anything where i feel like it's uh, it's unjust or unfair i i do get quite worked up about it and and like you said you know it's not just you know that feeling of being violated but it's also you know people taking advantage then of the opportunity and making money off of it and that's that's yeah. something that i'm even dealing with today you know a stock website that is selling ai stock um you know i see my name still used in the prompt which is the title of that stock image so you know it's a stock image for sale and it says right on the title in the style of joel robison so you can't yeah. deny the fact that someone is typing my name into a, an ai platform getting a result and then loading it onto a stock website to sell and so it's like you know someone is literally trying to profit off of my name and and that's yeah 
it's a very bizarre thing to explain and in you know not everyone is going to have that experience and and so it's hard to find the people that understand what that feels like um yeah. and it's also you know i've I've been quite vocal, like you said, I have shared my thoughts and, you know, the internet is not always the kindest place. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, you know, when, yeah. when I have been vocal about it, I've had pushback from people who just said, you know, you need to get over it or you need to adapt or die. And it's just sort of like, that's not, that's not an yeah. artist's way of thinking. <laughs> like artists don't think like that. <laughs> I can only just, I can only imagine a number of people said, get over it. I can already, I can already hear it and, and see it in those things. Get over it, move on kind of thing. But mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, people have been, you could have said that for years, you know, whenever anybody tried to, you know, use something that was under copyright, you know, get over it doesn't, doesn't stand up in court, you know, but <laughs> speaking of court, I mean, we're still, we're still in the very early days of this, you know, we, mm -hmm. we're, uh, you know, we haven't seen the finish line of what's going to happen legally there's got to be some point where you know the, the there's a fork in the road of we decide like you know this has to you know be taken care of legally or um we get over it you know sort of thing yeah. so um there's still a lot of things to to iron out especially when it comes to the fact that your name is being used your intellectual property is being used to to for monetarily purpose for, for someone else to gain from it so um you know and there was people as i say like ourselves getty flicker smug you know we were all blind to the fact that you know people were um go, you know going to use this and you know at some point in the future someone's going to troll through the entire website and you know the entire internet and, and just you, know, you scrape all the images off it and something so yeah. you know the whole the whole industry is kind of waking up to to that uh, scenario and you know it's obviously against everybody's terms and conditions to do that it's <laughs> you know it's not it's not acceptable to do that on our <laughs> platform so you know at some point you know there's 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 got to be a um you know a moment where where people decide what you know what's right and what's wrong definitely and i think you know that's kind of the conversations i've been having over the past couple of days when i i just shared about this recent experience with the stock website you know i've said a few times to people it's a little bit like the wild west there's like no mm. there is no set guideline there is no set law or restriction or 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 anything it's just sort of like your own ethical or moral standing and, and it's really down to the person and it's down to the company it's down to the the platform what where it's being allowed and and so you know unfortunately we live in a world where people are enticed by a dollar sign and and i think that that can kind of cloud people's maybe moral code a little bit more than maybe they it usually is and i think you know that's sort of this maybe the saving grace as well is that you know there's there is still room for those uh, limitations or protections to be put into place and 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 you know hopefully that that happens yeah you know i i think it might even go a, a little bit farther than that joe because i i one of the reasons i wanted to have you on the show was because of your your you're you're the real deal artist, right? So you're <laughs> you're you're not just somebody that's like, hey, I figured out how to you know do this technique in Photoshop or whatever app, and I want to show people that I can do this thing. Like you said at the beginning of this discussion, these pieces are are come from a very personal place within you. Hmm. So when I was thinking about this this discussion, I was thinking, yeah, so and that that personal place in all of those personal places someone poured into a machine and mm. not only is the monetization piece of it a slap in the face i think but also just now someone could create something without the soul and the thought and the emotion and pain that you pour into one of these pieces it's a type of prompt and boom hey yeah. there's a guy with a balloon or something right and they have no idea why it's to, why a, a a robust in peace looks like it looks. They just kind of get the the surface level of it. I wonder if who knows how this stuff is going to play out, right? Like Alistair said, we're it's still in the courts. Who knows what the what the the eventual law will be? If the even if it's even possible to put it back in the the toothpaste back in the tube, because we're talking. Mm. 
it's not just one country, right? It's <laughs> everyone, everyone has these tools and you, you, we don't have a, a global governing body, you know, to enforce no. copyright like that. So, you know, in, in some ways you can't unbake the cake, right? Your, your ingredients are in the cake. The only way to, to fix it is to throw the whole cake away, all the cakes, right? So then, yeah. so then what do you do? So that said, painting mm. that kind of slightly optimistic though also very bleak picture of where, <laughs> where things are going like if you had your th your your druthers uh joel where would you take this like if you could you were a king of the world with, uh, with AI. <laughs> you know I, I i that's the thing is like i said before like i'm not naive enough to think that it's not helpful or there's no benefit to it or or there's you know that it's all bad i i i don't think that and you know i think that there has been um advances in technology that have used ai that have really benefited people and and you know i can see it being a benefit for accessibility for maybe people that have limitations or that need you know assistance in a way that you know previous technology hasn't allowed them to to use or to create with and, and i certainly understand that um i i would hate to to limit anyone in, in their creativity and and I think you know that's not the objective of any any creator and and as a person who in, who teaches I would never want to to tell someone like you're forbidden to to create in that way um, I think it's it's it is such a, a tricky situation because you know there are people that feel maybe that they they want to create but don't know how and, and this is a shortcut to, to getting to that point and I think you know what worries me is that we are losing um, kind of the joy of learning something and and the joy mm -hmm. of struggle <laughs> um, yeah. you know there there is a certain amount of, of joy that comes from plowing through something difficult and finally sure. getting to the other side and and we we're losing that and and I was listening to a podcast the other day where where someone said you know we're like a generation away from you know imagination dying and and like people not imagining things people not mm. like literally not being able to imagine things because why would i need to when someone can do it something can do it for me when like why would i need to imagine what a castle made out of clouds looks like when i can just tell you know a prompt engine to just show me it and so like that that terrified me when i was like oh wow like that's that's scary to think that mm -hmm. our 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 evolution as as people is, is really at a, a turning point and so i think it's just finding the way that we can balance the tools and, and and using the tools but not replacing the the artist and 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 that's the battle i think that we're seeing is that you know the the excitement about it is there it's new it's it's you know, enticing, and I, I understand that, but we need to make sure that we're not replacing, you know, people that are still using their skills to to tell a story or to paint a picture or to write a song or, or a book. You know, those people are important and, and their viewpoints are important, and we don't want to lose that for something that is just a machine. Um, it's yeah. quite It's quite important. Yeah, yeah. I wonder how though. You know how how do you safeguard <laughs> that with the, with this stuff? You, I mean, you see how fast these things are moving. What was it? Just this past week, Go or not Google? Uh, OpenAI announced Sora, which mm -hmm. is a, video. Yeah, yeah. A text to video, which looks in its version, whatever iteration this is, it's already pretty scary, you know, in terms of what you can create from just a text prompt and that. And remember AI in general, this whole generative AI and chat GPT and all that stuff, for the most part, especially with the chat GPT stuff, that was um, 18 months, two, less than two years ago. <laughs> that yeah. it, we, two years ago, we had no idea what a GPT was, right? And, <laughs> And now it's changing entire industries and the generative AI is sparking conversations like this. And, you know, like you said, Joel, there, there are haters and there are proponents and people that are in the middle and the legalities around it, monetization, copyright. It's just this storm of stuff. Meanwhile, these technology companies that are behind these AI movements are moving faster than Silicon Valley ever moved. Like yeah. ChatGPT, 
rose to what what 100 million users faster than any app in the history of silicon valley and it's not stopping so yeah i wonder i wonder we don't know i mean we could hypothesize all day long about where it's going to go and what's going to happen who's going to be affected we don't know we have no idea it's going to be positive and negative but how deep we have no idea yet so yeah and i think that's the important thing about artists speaking up as well and and you know I'm really lucky that I live in in a, a community of other artists, so we're kind of aware of what's going on. But I also have a whole, you know, my, none of my family members are artists, so you know, when I tell them that this stuff is happening, they are like furious or like outraged because they just have no idea that that's mm. that that's even happening. And I think you know, the vast majority of people probably don't know what the the dangers are or what the the kind of underbelly of this looks like and so you know even when i i shared on my instagram story yesterday about what was happening with the stock website i had so many comments and messages from people just saying like i had no idea or this is outrageous and it's like okay that's a tiny little subset of people that had no clue that this was happening and so it really does depend unfortunately you know the burden lays on the people that are are you know experiencing it um but it is up to us essentially to to you know stand up for ourselves and just say you know this is not this is not acceptable or this is happening and you know we need to be more aware and so whether it's you know training family members like maybe don't share that on facebook if you think (laughs) it's ai or like maybe it just likes not ask chat gpt to like fill out your job application for you or whatever it is you know um it's just like we kind of have to just you know take opportunities to just kind of nip it a little bit and just educate people as well just to tell them you know this is this is the reality of what's happening from maybe a perspective they don't know yeah i mentioned on last week's show that and i'd like your thoughts on this joel is is there is there an opportunity here where well, if we have AI just flooding the flooding the world with soulless creative pieces, is there an opportunity for the true artist to rise above and to be valued above that and be recognised for being, you know, the tangible analog artist who, you know, who's actually doing something different from the masses who are all using mm-hmm. AI? Being doing something from the different from the masses has always been a great way to survive in any industry. And I wonder yeah. if this actually creates a little bit of an opportunity that way. Yeah, I think I've got like a couple kind of pieces on that. And when when AI first started coming out and I was sort of explaining it to other people, um, I, I'm a big fan of coffee. And so I kind of likened it to like, you can go to a gas station or a vending machine and you can get what is called a cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> It's probably not going to be good. It's probably cheap um, and it's there and it's accessible and you can just push a button and it will come out and like, ta-da, there you go. And it will probably get the job done. You might not enjoy it, but it'll get the job Mm -hmm. done. Or you can take your time and you can go to a coffee shop and a barista will ask you what you want and you will tell them and they will use their experience to make that specifically for you. Sometimes even put your name on it and like you'll have an interaction with someone and You know, if it's a good cup of coffee, you'll remember that. I can remember going to specific coffee shops and I can remember that experience. And and AI for me is sort of like that, like a generated image that someone plopped into a prompt is sort of like that instant cup of coffee that you get from a vending machine. It's just like this idea of something. It's not necessarily the greatest version of it. Um, and then a piece of work that someone's created is, is sort of a crafted thing. And I think for me, what this has done is it's actually, <laughs> I think I, I'm a fairly stubborn person. I never like being told what to do ever. So whenever anyone tells me to do something, I will just do the complete opposite of what they're asking me to do just to prove a point that I don't need to listen to them. And so when AI first kind of became a big thing and everyone was jumping at it, I was just like, you know what? I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to like learn how to make my own stuff with my hands. And like, that's what I've kind of been doing is, is, you know, if I need a certain prop or I need an object in an image, I'll make it and I'll learn how to do it with my hands. And, and if anything, it's actually enticed me to go even further back to like doing everything manually and, and, Mm. you know, relying more on my skill set. And, and I'm probably 
in the minority because of you know the temptation of all of this but for me personally i think it, it's put the value of creating um the, in the way that i do it's, it's increased the value for me and i yeah. think i hope i hope that people will still just like you know there's people that will go to a gas station and be totally happy with whatever they get out of that coffee machine there's still a lot of people that prefer to go to, you know, an independent coffee shop and, and have a good cup of coffee and savor the experience. And, and I hope that there's still going to be that in regards to art, that there's people and, and clients and, and, you know, opportunities for that to continue for people to support artists that continue to create in, in traditional ways or in ways that are fully, you know, themselves putting the work into it. Oh, I think you're bang on. That's exactly the kind of thoughts I was leading. And it's a great analogy, the coffee one. Um, I definitely see people valuing tangible things more. We're, we're, we're seeing a, a big growth in uh, film photography uh, over mm -hmm. the last year as people go back, almost, as you say, rebelling against the simplicity and ease of digital, uh, going back to that. We're, we're the huge mega growth in vinyl sales and, mm -hmm. and turntables globally as people want, it's too easy just to go on to iTunes and find the song. I want to experience something. I want to read the the cover notes. I want to put the, the vinyl on the turntable and, you know, pick the song I want to listen to. Um, so I think there will be uh, the, some sort of rebel alliance <laughs> that, um, <laughs> that gathers that gathers up, and I think there will still be those clients who maybe even more than ever value um, real artists. Mm -hmm. like the, yeah, the the human society is what it'll be called. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, authentically human, only human. you know. It, it's so funny. You know, we can wrap up with this, and we'll move into the picks of the week segment with the. Uh, the one thing that struck me about this conversation was we're talking about photography, we're talking about pixels and creative, visually creative things, right? This, the, the AI issue, phenomena, whatever you want to call it, touches most creative industries. In fact, before this call, um, I was watching YouTube videos about AI singing voices and mm -hmm. how now you can just write your song and have it sing it in whatever man, female, child, whatever, and throw a beat behind it. And, you know, so singers afraid, copywriters mm -hmm. afraid, musicians. artists, photographers, musicians, lawyers, paralegals, doctors, you know, <laughs> it's, it's touching all of these industries. And I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I mean, you you kind of hit it on the head, Joel. Like, do you do you go with the flow? Um, and and I think that's the answer, right? Part of it is you need to, in order to exist in what the steamroller world is going to be, you need to at least understand it. You don't have to embrace it or love mm -hmm. it, but you got to understand it, right? In 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 order for us to move forward. But then, but then what, right? So what is what is the outcome? One of the things we talked about last week, Alistair, I remember was we, we started a conversation, which I think we should con continue at some point, about the differences between a photographer's perception, like in the context of AI, you're a photographer, you're a creative, AI is doing X, Y, and Z per this conversation to you and your family. And then there's the other side of it, which is the consumer of your content, the art or the uh, the you know, the civilian, as it were, right? Do they have the same perceptions or are they just, they just looking for, I need a really cool shot of a landscape with a hot air balloon mm -hmm. floating up, you know, above it. I don't care how I get it, I just want it. And these are the people that instead of hiring a photographer would go to Microstock or Freestock or whatever, right? And that was just last week's episode was, is AI the new micro stock, <laughs> right? Mm. So I don't know. So you know, in that in that lens, do you do you see that Joel like splitting those two those those two groups, the artists that are like, oh my god, ingested all my work, it's this, it's that, it's you know, it's it's bastardizing all of that we worked all of our lives to learn how to do, and then on the other side is like, oh yeah, Sistine Chapel, yeah, that's nice. Okay, oh, <laughs> you know, you know, the consumer or the tourists. What, what do you think? 
Yeah, I think that there's, you know, just as much as artists have sort of this grand kind of um, spectrum of, of abilities and levels, I think <laughs> viewers or kind of the audience is going to have that as well. So you're going to have people that are going to look at every little detail of a piece. And then some people, like you said, are just after that bite-sized thing that they need right now. And, um, you know, that's that's never the role of the person that's making it to decide whether this is something that people want to look at for hours or if they're only going to pay attention for a second, because I know I'm guilty of going to a museum or an art gallery and, you know, there's a painting by a painter that was painted over years and, and they've mastered this technique and I will walk right past it because I, I'm not emotionally connected to it and it doesn't necessarily draw me in. Um, that doesn't mean that it's a bad painting. It doesn't mean that that painter was not skilled. It just means that I wasn't connected to it. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting um, kind of time where we kind of learn. I think the artists will learn kind of where they stand in, in the grand scheme of things. And then, you know, the viewer is going to have to learn as well. Like, you know, not everything is going to be able to be done instantly. And, and we can, we do live in a very instant based society where we're used to being able to have whatever we want when we want it. And, and I think that's setting a dangerous precedent because we, we do need to learn that things take time and things it's okay that things take time to, to produce and to be made. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's finding that happy balance between, you know, creating a piece of work that you're happy with, that you spent time on, but also kind of knowing that our attention span is, as a society is shortening and, and, mm -hmm. you know, it might not live on as long as you hope that it does. Yeah. 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 It's, it's interesting. We could go on and on with these with this conversation because <laughs> it's, you know, there's, I wanted to, we're not going to do it now, but I wanted to touch on the whole idea of, we talked about monetization a little bit mm. and just the perception of or the, the the value perception of creative work now versus pre AI, you know, from let's mm. say an uh, an art director's perspective with a limited budget, just like in the stock photography world, when that hit, it's like, oh, you know, I only have ten thousand dollars for this project, I'm gonna go get some free photography versus blowing the entire budget on a photographer for that. Are we gonna see similar shifts, you know, as perceptions of what's possible with just a prompt filter into the people that would have hired a photographer or a creative to create the work in the past and how does that shift the creative side you know the humans does it make our work mm. the humans work more valuable or less valuable i mean alistair's mm. you know, like alistair from your perspective more valuable right because now it's human you know yeah you could get that you could get it from a keurig or you could <laughs> you could you know get your own you know espresso machine and go to town right so yeah you know, i don't know it's scary so let's uh let's jump into our picks of the week segment right <coughs> this is this is the part of the show where you guys get to recommend or we all get to recommend something to the audience that is somehow related even tangentially to photography so tangentially for sharky james sharky knows why i'm saying that um so we'll let you go first joe if you have one if you have i know we're putting you on the spot there but if you have a pick of the week we'll let you throw it out there yeah mine is it's definitely um a small item and it's definitely you know something that i didn't know that would benefit me until i actually started using it um so i use uh, a microsoft surface studio um so i get to edit right on the screen and i'm also left-handed which um as means that i make a mess out of most things when i write or use a pencil or a pen um so i use this little handy like editing glove and so it's just like a weird glove that goes onto like half of your hand so when you're editing your hand never actually touches the screen which means that there's no like rogue pixels and the screen isn't jumping around and like i i would always end up finding like little random dots or like weird things that have happened when i wasn't paying attention because my hand brushed against the the canvas while i was painting or, or whatever it is and so it's just like a little you know, five dollar thing off of Amazon that, um, yeah, it's it's kind of just made that those little changes that um, I didn't even know that I needed until I started using it. And I was like, oh, this is actually 
quite helpful. <laughs> you, you probably just so, sold about <laughs> 50 of those. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I post like a, a story or a reel and I, I'm wearing it or putting it on, people are like, what are you wearing? And then when I say it, they're like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it mm -hmm. does. Oh, it's not just a fashion statement? Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, it also looks super cool. It's as close as I'm ever going to get to like a superhero's costume or uniform. <laughs> like the reverse um, Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Very cool. All right, that's perfect, Joel. Thank you for sharing that. Alistair Jolly, do you have a pick of the week you want to share with us? I do. I have, I have one I'm quite excited about this week. Um, we've spoken at, at length over you know the last however many episodes about how my photography is moving more and more to being mobile based uh, as I'm traveling for work and as I'm creating content and creating even video and stories mm -hmm. and stuff. I'm doing more more of it on on the iphone these days um so i got a new gadget for it and it kind of looks like a camera can you mm -hmm. see that mm -hmm. this this is called the pro grip now one of the issues i have when i'm using my mobile phone is i have really big hands and this although i have the biggest iphone I'm still always terrified that I'm going to drop it, right? It's It always feels like I'm kind of balancing it within a few fingers. And, you know, if I'm leaning over the edge of a canyon wall, as I was mm -hmm. recently, or top of a building or something, I'm always terrified I'm going to drop it. And I was recommended this thing in the Pro Grip. And it basically turns my phone into a much more stable, kind of traditional-looking camera. So what you have mm -hmm. is the, the the grip itself for the hand, and then you have um, the 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 slots and the grips where the phone goes. So I'm going to slide um, going to slide my phone into it now, um, and with with the phone in place, can you see that? Ah. Now it's really well gripped on the back. There's no chance I'm going to drop this. It's really solid in there. And I now have this super base to hold it really steady. It has this little strap around it, so I'm definitely not going to drop everything. Um, but I can also then use my left hand as well. So I can really start to hold hold this more like a traditional camera, even though it's, it's my iPhone. Via Bluetooth, it has a trigger button. So a little trigger button here on the top so I can take the pictures by pressing the button like a traditional camera. Mm. It also flips. So I can That's do the uh, right there. I, I can that. do vertical vertical video. <laughs> Uh, whether you there's a whole other conversation we've had that conversation <laughs> very very cool yes. video um but now it's very cool video is more important now than ever as you know content creators for for social media so no matter whether i'm vertical or horizontal it's super stable um yeah and that's that's the main benefit you know we have quite quite a long telephoto lens uh, on the phones nowadays so being able to hold it more like a traditional camera for these big hands was an absolute godsend. Um, so I've actually been loving, I've been loving that uh, usability of it just for that core core job that it does of, of making an iPhone more like a, a traditional camera. But there's more, more you say, yeah. Um, has uh, the ability to put a cold shoe adapter on the top. So there's a little thread on the top. So as a content creator, you can put um, a cold shoe on there for a lighting rig, for microphones, or indeed for like receivers for um, you know wireless uh, wireless audio. Um, it has a thread on the base for your tripod, USB C, um, and the reason it's USB C is because this bottom part is actually a power bank. So in here, there's like a 6,000 megaamp hour battery pack in here, uh, which one facilitates the Bluetooth, but also means it charges my phone. So um, the in in the in back here is compatible with MagSafe charging. Um, so when you turn on the um, the battery pack, um, it will it will suddenly charge your phone, and you can see there it's it's charging charging my phone via the pack so i i get longer content creation because it you know charges my phone uh depending on your phone it'll charge it you know three times potentially the the capacity of your phone and then to top it off at night it becomes a nightstand 
it stands <laughs> stands vertically and you can see your see your phone by your bedside um and it's also quite good for doing facetime and stuff when it stands up so uh that's the pro grip it's by a company called shift cam um yeah i've been loving using it in the field uh for the short period that i've had it it makes me feel way more secure when I'm dangling over things with my expensive iPhone. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, and I'm I'm guessing yeah. the the shots that you take with that, especially if you're rolling video in no gimbal, right? Well, sure the camera has in body image stabilization, but that grip like that is going to give you more of a, a stable shot, right? And it's just more comfortable than Yeah, shooting video know. shooting video now with the iPhone like I don't want to use a gimbal now because the inbuilt stabilization is is so good, but I still want to hold it secure. I want to give it the best opportunity to be stable as possible. So, um, yeah, I find myself more and more just shooting with the, let's call it naked iPhone, um, but with the risk of at any point I was going to drop it. So this, you know, and suddenly rather than carrying a huge camera gear in my bag, you know, I'm carrying, you know, my iPhone, which I'm going to have anyway, and just this this little grip with the benefits of, you know, a battery pack and uh, a, a nightstand and all that type of stuff. So, yeah, oh. really, I, I, when someone, when a dear friend of mine reckon, recommended it to me, I was a little bit skeptic. I was like, yeah, that looks a, bit, a little bit gimmicky. Love it. Absolutely love it. What so, was the product yeah, name again? enjoying it. It's called the Pro Grip by a company called Shift Cam. Shift uh, okay. Yeah, it's about 130 right. pounds, I think. So yeah. Nice, nice. Yeah. What about you, Frederick? What do you got for us this week? I was going to say, hopefully that thing is available on Amazon because that feels like an impulse buy. <laughs> 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 Joel's not getting it. I know Joel's like, no. I, 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 I mean, it I might tempt me. My phone, <laughs> <laughs> it's worth it for the nightstand. <laughs> if yeah, anything is going to tempt me, it's something like that. Yeah. So here, here's my my pick of the week. Um, you may have seen these things, right? So, oh, I mm. thought. Oh, for a second there, I thought that was something different. Something that for costs... a split second there, I thought that was yeah, an that... Apple product. <laughs> that, no, that is a that is a Meta product. That is the Meta Quest Three headset, mm. and um, so I got that as a as a let's call it. Because I can't get the <laughs> the Apple Vision. You just can't get the Apple one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can get it, but it would be irresponsible for me to get that one right now. Um, but just real quick on that one, you know, there's been reviews on that headset ad nauseum. It's been out for about what four or five months or something. I'm late to the game with it, and I've had the previous Vision Pro, the Vision Pro, or not Vision Pro, but the the Quest nice. Two headset. Uh, this is the Quest Three. Um. I wasn't that impressed with the Quest 2, right? I was, it was, felt weird on my head and, you know, it was just not balanced and you get sweaty in there and it just, it was fun while you're in there playing around doing Beat Saber and all that and you just get fatigued and you put it down and it ended up being one of those devices that I would pick up every month or two, you know, at, at intervals and plug in just to charge it and update the firmware, the software on it. Um, this thing, though, fast forward to the to this one, the Quest Three. This one feels like what the first one should have been, right? And it, interestingly, the capabilities of that one, although no, nowhere near, maybe not quite as polished as what Apple is doing with the Vision Pro, it is a good kind of just oh my god i mean i am in a different world i am playing around with games i can understand what this reality this mixed reality and virtual reality existence that these companies are trying to push i can see what they're trying to do with this one very clearly the first one was like oh if this is virtual reality i'm, I'm not interested right this one is compelling and I would imagine that the Vision Pro, I haven't done my demo yet with the Vision Pro, but I imagine that one is, you know, kind of the, you know, the bee's knees of mixed reality and headset life. But um, I would check it out. You know, it's this one was, uh, I want to say $400, somewhere in that range versus Apple's $4,000-ish for theirs. <laughs> it's a good entryway. And it, it is... Um, it does all the things like right? the mixed reality where I could have aliens running around the floor in my house or I can put my 
computer display on the wall and do all the things. So not as good and not as seamless and not as fast or as beautiful as Apple, but you know, you get a kind of a signpost as to where things are going. So that's my pick of the week. And from a photo- so Joel- from a photography standpoint, why is the Vision why is the Vision Pro or the Quest 3 related to photography? <laughs> the nerd part of me wants to understand is that world going to be some place that creatives end up creating for right so as people build their little virtual existences or use mixed reality to hang virtual artwork on the wall you know permanently or in the real world qr codes that make things happen and augment the real world is that going to be an art form where some creatives are going to start playing oh, so 100 yeah, yeah i want to understand it so that's my but joel question, question for you of the three of us here you said that Wall-E is your favorite film. <laughs> Wait, of the three of us here, who's going to be the first one to be lying with their huge drink, with their vision headset on, floating around? Do you think it's you? Do you think it's me? Or do you think it's this guy? <laughs> I mean, I don't want to name names, but... <laughs> it's Frederick. I'm happy Let's to face. be that guy. I'm, Someone's got to be the been... first. I've always been kind of a, a tech first nerd early adopter in some ways. As I get older, I become less of an early adopter. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I've always been. Who's of, that guy floating you? past on his bed who can't walk anymore? Oh, it's Frederick. <laughs> <That's> a... <laughs> hey, you know what? That's a whole nother show. We had a. a note. We'll leave the, I'll close on this since it's AI related. Uh, I was talking to someone about. We were talking about GPTs and fine tuned GPTs where. You know, like a, a large company might put their whole knowledge base in the GPT so that they can have conversations with it, essentially. Um, and we were hypothesizing, like, well, what if you take the sum total of a person's existence throughout their life, all of their social posts, all of their emails, every letter they've ever written, all the recordings of them? What if they had a podcast and you got their voice and their intonations and their ideas about certain things, all of that, some total of it, and you throw it into a GPT and then you take a meta creation human to give it a face and then you take a 11 labs or open AI clone of the person's voice and now it has the voice so now you can have a conversation with something that looks like the person knows pretty much everything that person knew and sounds like the person when they respond how far are we from that (laughs) put it in a boston dynamics robot there you go you got the full package or not we work we work remotely now for the most part we're in Mm. zoom all day alistair right so (laughs) who cares right so you don't need a physical body. So anyway, so yeah. I'll leave on that. If you want to be scared, scary thoughts think are about, funny, Sean. Think, <laughs> think about that when you talk about immortality. Yeah, some when company you, do you do that, with, that says we'll make you immortal. You, you know? <laughs> yeah, but do you do that? Is, do you do that with the person's permission, or is what's going to happen mm-hmm. is suddenly after they die, suddenly they're doing things that they never gave permission to? You know? So exactly, exactly. It's that sloping in. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to go see Dave Chappelle or virtual Dave Chappelle perform? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's all coming. Cool. All right, we'll leave it right there. Um, Alistair, any last thoughts? And then, Joel, I'll no, throw it to you for parting shots. A huge, I do have one last quick thing. A big thank you to Joel for joining me on the photo walk. We had Flickr's 20th anniversary uh, on the 10th of February. I hosted a photo walk in, in London, and Joe very graciously came along and spoke to some of the folks there. So, Joe, thank you for coming to that. Uh, Frederick, you've got your one coming up uh, this weekend, I believe, right? That's right. Yeah, this weekend, Saturday, the 24th of February, on the Embarcadero in San Francisco. I'll put a link to all the details in the show notes for this. I'm going to release this episode quickly. So you'll, you know, folks, if you want to come join us for the photo walk this Saturday, please do. You know, we're going to hang out. We're going to start at Red's Java House, I believe it's called Red's Java House on the Embarcadero, Mm -hmm. and then make our way down to Pier 23 Restaurant and Bar and you know talk about Flickr, joel if you were here great you know we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about Flickr. Yeah. some of the Flickr people are gonna be there jumping a plane joel yeah it's gonna be great, it's gonna be great. No, we, we had a good time in london thanks again for it's always a pleasure to have you <laughs> all right cool uh, all right guys it was great joel you have the you have the honor of giving us the last parting shot 
What are your thoughts on this whole thing that we talked <laughs> about in the show? You know, mi mixing AI and compositing art and where it's going and is it is it you know <laughs> has your soul been sucked into the machine and people are prompting <laughs> images from it all that would it give us your last thoughts and don't hold back you can say whatever <laughs> i won't i, won't, I think I, won't uh, <laughs> I think i'll be i'll still be diplomatic in my reply and, and just encourage people to to seek out the joy of creating and to 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 not forget about the the joy of struggle and the joy of accomplishment and the joy of learning and to if you don't know how to do something it's okay to to learn how to do it and uh and and that's that's the whole beauty of creating is that you never fully know how something is going to turn out and and just to embrace that and to enjoy it and to to seek that out in in the art that you consume as well look for people that that are telling a good story and and that have that that the backing behind it love it perfect words to live well said, by and, and to end on all right guys <laughs> you have a have a good rest of your day thanks for taking the time for this conversation it's been fantastic we're gonna have to continue it though i feel like there's gonna be more to talk about <laughs> as things unfold so joel though this is, we haven't seen the last of you okay <laughs> all right i'll be here <laughs> all right all right guys take care is twitter.